Hi folks, I am uh, Dr. Rob Sivas. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. And there has been consternation and a lot of concern from a lot of my patients. I'm getting emails and phone calls about a paper that was recently released by a group of folks led by uh, Dr. Dave Feldman and Matt Budoff. Great, great people, all for the majority of them, good connections that I have in the ketogenic space. I consider all of these folks to be friends and mentors and very, very smart people. And they conducted the LMHR, Lean Mass Hyperresponder Study, to determine if high levels of LDL that these patients have to have to meet that criteria, high levels of cholesterol, high levels of LDL, correlate with the formation of cardiovascular plaque as most of the rest of the world assumes and the entire statin-using uh, world predicts. So, yes, the uh, study very eloquently, what these guys did is they took a group of people that met the LMHA, LMHR criteria. I have several patients in the study. They did two studies. Um, but the first study is looking at a group of LMHR people with certain criteria, lean mass, uh, elevated LDL, elevated triglycerides, uh, elevated LDL, elevated cholesterol, elevated HDL, low triglycerides, um, and an A1C below six, for what it's worth. Not sure I would have done that, but uh, um, that's the LMHR category. They then did a CT angiogram of their heart to look at how much plaque they had, soft and hard plaque. Then they restudied them a year later, or I think two years later in the comparative group, and they looked at any increase in plaque. And number one, they proved categorically, as we knew before, as I've known for a very long time, and that's why I'm so comfortable not prescribing statins, um, as we knew before, that lower, that, that high triglycerides, uh, sorry, high cholesterol and high LDL does not correlate with an increase in cardiovascular risk or increase in plaque formation. We knew that before. This study, in a very eloquent way, quantifies that. And also, the two modern things that the cardiologists are now using, oh, it's more sensitive, which is um, apolipoprotein B and LP little a, also did not, as expected, correlate with the accumulation of soft plaque. Okay? However, that, so that... that absolutely proved the hypothesis. And that that is very reassuring, but we kind of knew that before. And I will put the, in the show notes, I'll put this paper um, from my friends, uh, from my friend um, Dave Feldman and his cohort. Um, one of the smartest physicians I've ever met, by the way, is, is uh, a guy called Adrian Sotomota, uh, a guy that lives in Mexico City, just ridiculously brilliant. But um, so they had great characters uh, producing this paper. But here's what they also found, which they didn't expect, but I did, is that there was an increase. There was an increase in soft plaque formation, non-calcified plaque volume, and CAC score, plaque score, total plaque score, went up during that year of study. And this caused the panic buttons to hit. And I just got a flood of calls from my patients. Secondly, um, there's another statistic from a separate, I believe it's a separate study. Uh, the data is still being suppressed here. It's still being uh, written about. So, And that is, that is one of the things that I have a problem with. I love these guys to bits. I, they are mentors for me. They're brilliant. But they've handled the PR extremely poorly. They've handled it because they didn't expect the backlash that they did. However, I'm fully in support of these folks. They did brilliant science. And there is an absolute explanation for what they've said. They're not going to like my explanation because it denotes a problem. But they then did a study where they compared the lean mass hyperresponder that are supposed to be these super healthy people with high LDL and low levels of heart disease. They looked at their progressive soft plaque formation and they compared it with a similar group of people that were eating a standard American diet. And obviously the hypothesis is LMHR, clean eating, a lot of these people are pure carnivores, they're all fat adapted, should have a statistically lower plaque progression than the standard American diet people. They didn't. They had about the same progression 
they had about the same progression of plot formation. Oh my God, why? I've got a lot of patience in the study. I know why. And I'm not better than anybody. It's just being a little bit more objective and not having the cognitive dissonance. You can tell I'm not a lean mass hyperresponder. I'm a fat guy. Blood work is beautiful. Blood work meets LMHR criteria. The reason I'm not an LMHR is because I'm fat. My BMI is 26, 9, 27. Down from over 40. I'm not an LMHR, but my, by, by my blood work, I am. And I am intentionally not an LMHR. Ooh, I'm intentionally, I could be, but I'm intentionally not. And here's why. And this is very important to understand, okay? We know absolutely, categorically, categorically, that insulin resistance, insulin resistance caused by chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption in a certain subset of the population who cannot, for a variety of genetic reasons, uh, reasons produce massive amounts of insulin. So these they produce higher insulin than fasting insulins. So they can produce, they can have hyperinsulinemia, but when they eat a lot of sugar and starch, their insulin resistance, the receptor downregulation, the sep uh, receptor phosphorylation of their cells is greater than they can produce insulin. They cannot get sugar into their cells. They cannot clear sugar from their bloodstream. So their blood sugar grows up. They may gain a little bit of weight, but they're usually not very fat. And they are what we call diabesogenic. As you've heard me say many times, I'm very obesogenic. I can produce massive amounts of insulin. So no matter what the blockade is, I can produce high enough insulin to clear my blood sugar. That's why I'm a fat guy, but my blood sugars are normal. A1C, 5.2, okay? So the diabesogenic people genetically, when they also eat a high carbohydrate diet, develop insulin resistance, cannot produce enough insulin, blood sugar goes up, they start to develop, to develop vascular inflammation caused by hyperglycemia, and they develop cardiovascular disease, soft and hard plaque, because of diabetes, because of chronically elevated and spiking blood sugar. You know, folks, I use Ketone IQ uh, for a variety of different reasons, but recently Ketone IQ or HVMN, the company that produces it, has spent a lot of money uh, supporting funding for studies because, okay, this makes me feel better, but is there data, is there research to support this? And um, one of the big studies that they've just uh, released, and they were at the Boston Marathon, they support the Tour de France, is do exogenous ketones boost athletic performance? I'm going to do a whole long talk on this, uh, discussing this from a performance perspective. But I can tell you, and you'll see in the show notes, you'll see the ad, uh, you'll see the study. In a placebo-controlled study with trained athletes, so these are fit folks, ketone IQ boosted average sprint power by 19%, peak power by 13%. So you got sprint power by 19%, peak power by 13%, and cut fatigue by 10%, increasing the speed of recovery. And it also spiked blood ketones five times higher than normal in 20 minutes in fat-adapted trained athletes. So there is strong evidence that ketone IQ does boost athletic performance in the short term. I've played around with this. I'm not a trained athlete. I am fat-adapted ketosis. It works in my own life. If you're an athlete out there, do the experiment. Okay? That's insulin resistance. And one of the roles that I play as a physician is to help people to transition away from insulin resistance toward insulin sensitivity, where you upregulate and dephosphorylate the receptors. So you need, you have a lot of receptors and you don't need much insulin to clear the sugar, but that only happens when the cells need sugar. They're not trying to protect themselves, which means you are not consuming carbohydrates in your diet. That is the principle of a low carbohydrate diet. And I use the word specifically there, low carbohydrate diet, healthy fat, moderate protein. Okay. And we can, over the course of about two years, restore and measure insulin sensitivity, where you have a moderately elevated glucagon a lowish insulin and glucagon and insulin are reactive to each other in a polar opposite way. 
During storage phase, when you're storing your food, your insulin goes up, your glucagon goes down, and between meals, your glucagon goes up, your insulin goes down, and you use fat. So there's this ebb and flow, storage and utilization. That is insulin sensitive. Okay? Now, in order to release insulin, you have to have a little bit of sugar in your body. Because sugar triggers GLP-1, GLP-1 triggers insulin. And I have a number of people in the lean mass hyperresponder uh, plan who are fastidious long-term carnivores. And what happens in humans when you are a long-term carnivore is you don't trigger GLP-1 because it requires carbohydrates, glucose, galactose, fructose to trigger GLP-1. And GLP-1 then triggers insulin and blocks glucagon. And when that goes down, you see the oscillation. So on a low carbohydrate, but not a zero carbohydrate diet, that is optimal, optimal with a short period of eating, some intermittent fasting is the optimal human diet to create insulin sensitivity. The LMHRs, by definition, how do we know this? Because insulin regulates cholesterol formation and cholesterol uptake from the gut. And the LMHRs are taking up mass, they're eating a lot of fat, they're taking up massive amounts of cholesterol from their, from their gut, not regulated because their insulin levels are low. So that's super high cholesterol, not a concern for me, but the super high cholesterol represents the fact that their insulin levels are low. Testosterone levels may come down. Blood sugar rises because they don't have adequate insulin to clear the sugar. Where's the sugar coming from? It's coming from the conversion of protein to sugar, gluconeogenesis. So these LMHRs typically have, and I measure this all the time, super high glucagon, super low insulin. That's why we use the word insulin suppression because they're not releasing insulin in response to GLP-1. Amino acids create about a 10 to 20% insulin rise, but not adequate to clear the sugar. So their blood sugars start fluctuating, rising. Their A1Cs rise, not necessarily to diabetic range, but 5.7, 5.8, 5.9, elevated blood sugar. And in that proportion of LMHRs that also come from a diabetogenic background, that accumulation, that insulin suppression, inability to clear the sugar, and a diabetogenic propensity toward vascular inflammation results in plaque formation. So in our LMHR fastidious carnivore high fat patients who are genetically susceptible, they will form plaque. And the, the interesting thing is that when you're insulin suppressed, your body behaves no differently by the numbers than if you are, for, for the most part, than if you're insulin um, resistant. We see the elevation in blood sugar, we see the elevation in A1C, we see the vascular inflammation. One of the big differences though, with the insulin resistant people, we see low HDL, um, and high triglycerides. With the LMHRs, we see high, high HDL, but rising triglycerides usually. Rising triglycerides, rising blood sugars, low insulin. These folks have very high insulin. They have high glucagon because there's a disconnect between glucagon and insulin. The uh, lean mass hyperresponder insulin suppressed people have very low insulin and super high glucagon. So I can tell the difference. I can tell where you are. Low testosterone in men, recurrence of PCOS, some fatigue, kind of the Paul Saladino 2020 picture. And it's the absence of carbohydrates in their diet that's the problem. So the problem is not cholesterol. Problem's insulin. Problem is insulin. And actually the problem is GLP-1, not even insulin. It's seen as low insulin, but the problem is it's low GLP-1 triggering as the insulin spike. The back end, the appetite suppression GLP-1 is working, but that doesn't really significant insulin. So you can correct this by introducing a small amount of carbohydrate to your diet. And we've been doing this for about seven or eight years now. We recognized insulin suppression in our beautiful LMHR population, and we started to introduce some carbohydrate. And the reason why I'm not in the ultra low weight LMHR population is because I do eat a little bit of carbohydrates as milk and maybe some vegetables to trigger insulin. 
but my cholesterol and my LDL is high, not in the LMHR territory. My body weight is preserved and I'm not worried about it. Yeah, I'd like to lose a little bit more weight, but I'd rather carry the extra weight and have a normal blood profile, be insulin sensitive, than be insulin suppressed or insulin resistant. Hmm. The next video is going to talk about the difference between human biology and carnivore biology. And it's a very, very important concept that we don't understand. Because the final paradox I'll tell you is the fastest, best, most effective way to therapeutic way to get better, to lose weight and to uh, um, get rid of your diabetes is a pure, high fat, absolute pure carnivore diet. But it's not a good human diet in perpetuity. Hmm, and that's going to baffle a lot of people and upset a lot of people. But that is just me translating normal human physiology. And I'm going to go and do a deep dive into that in the next discussion. So the LMHR paper can be very easily explained by a concept of insulin suppression or a lack of GLP-1 triggering. And if you remove that out of the equation, you can correct the plaque formation in the insulin suppressed patients. And then you will see the difference that we see between plaque formation on insulin sensitive people who do not form plaque and the insulin resistant and the insulin suppressed patients. So while LMHR is a great place to get to, it's not a good place to stay. And in fact, Nick Norwitz published a, uh, a little YouTube video, tongue in cheek, eat Oreo cookies, you can lower your LDL. Absolutely, what are you doing? You're triggering GLP-1, you're triggering insulin, and you're lowering your cholesterol because insulin's doing its job. Fascinating. Please leave your comments. And if, if you don't know what to do, if you're now baffled and confused and upset and concerned, set up a visit. I'll go through your numbers and I'll give you some guidance as to how to optimize your body's physiology in a perpetuous way, in a sustainable, longitudinal way until you die. I am the carb addiction doc, not afraid of controversial things if the human physiology, the human biology supports my position. And in this case, it does. Watch the next video.